Well, hello friends and welcome to another Ask Zach. Today we are gonna talk about probably one of the most important endorsers of Fender guitars, uh, one of the most important Telecaster players of all time, and that's Jimmy Bryant. Probably someone who's not forgotten, but I would say severely underappreciated. And so we're gonna try to rectify that today and hopefully this episode will get you to dig deeper on, uh, on Jimmy Bryant. So while you're thinking about it, if you've been enjoying the episodes and you haven't done it yet, well, please go down in the corner and subscribe. And if you've already subscribed, then I would appreciate you uh, supporting Ask Zach. So there are many different ways. There's tip jar information in the description. There's merch at askzach.com, like this volume knob Ask Zach logo. Uh, there's coffee cups, like uh, that uh, Ask Zach logo one up there. And uh, yeah, and there's Friends of Ask Zach, which is a way to support me on a monthly basis. And I really appreciate everyone that has supported me. Thank you, guys. All right, Jimmy Bryant was born March 5th, 1925 as Ivy J. Bryant. And that was in Colquitt County, Georgia, near Moultrie. And he grew up, his dad was a sharecropper and his dad also played fiddle. And Jimmy, we're just gonna call him Jimmy. He went by various different names, including Buddy Bryant for a while, but we're gonna call him Jimmy just to be clear. So Jimmy ended up picking up the violin and learning how to play it, being taught by his dad, and learned how to play it so well that he ends up performing with his father. And they go around making money doing that. His father ends up uh, becoming, uh, you know, getting religion, as they would say, uh, in Georgia, and becomes a preacher. And so then he's playing uh, gospel music with his dad for a while, until the Second World War gets a roaring, as it did, and Jimmy is drafted. And Jimmy serves in the army and ends up getting wounded. Now, during that time when he was in the army and when he was uh, convalescing, he meets Tony Matola, the great jazz guitarist, and Jimmy decides to start playing the guitar. And he picks it up very quickly, and he's just like a sponge, and he's gleaning everything he can. Everything Tony shows him, he picks up and starts playing. Also, you know, he's being, he's, he was stationed in Europe, he hears Django Reinhardt, and he starts uh, being influenced by Django and all that great gypsy jazz music. Well, take all of that. The war ends. He moves back to the States, of course, and he finds himself out in California to, uh, to find work as a musician. And he begins playing with some of the various you know, country swing bands and ends up playing on a single for Tex Williams. And he also meets... Uh, Speedy West, the uh, pedal steel player that he'll end up doing uh, you know, albums with on Capitol. And he gets involved with uh, Cliffy Stone's hometown jamboree that was on local television and also they did concerts. And it's through that that he starts getting noticed by people at Capitol because on, on the show you had Tennessee Ernie Ford and other artists that were on Capitol, including like Merle Travis. And also, uh, a, a young or a younger Leo Fender. So, Cliffy Stone was having issues with their sound man. And again, this is late 40s, early 50s. And Leo Fender is not so incredibly busy that he can't do that. So, Cliffy Stone ends up hiring Leo Fender to run sound for him at his shows. And Jimmy Bryant's playing a Gibson guitar. Well... Leo develops the broadcaster, and what do you think he does? Well, of course, Leo Fender, being Leo, he brings one of his guitars to one of the shows. And Jimmy picks it up, loves it, because it cuts through the band better, and he's louder, which what guitar player doesn't want, want to be louder without feedback. And soon, well, you know, right then and there, Leo Fender has his first big endorser, and he's not just... Uh, you know, it's not just that he's right there and playing locally. He's a virtuoso. He is an amazing guitar player. He has an amazing facility on the instrument. He can play so fast. He can improvise so well. He is light years beyond many other guitarists. Um, so all of a sudden, there's good old Jimmy Bryant playing a broadcaster. 
He's in Fender ads, you know, with the with the guitar hiked up really high, and he's even got the uh, the early uh, the strap that uh, was uh, included with those early instruments. And the strap is really short, and so you kind of had to, if you used the strap that came with a, a, a black guard, you kind of had to, uh, you know, hike it up pretty high because you uh, you couldn't have it down low in the in the rock and roll position, as it were. So. Speedy West and Jimmy Bryant get a deal with Capitol Records, which that's huge. They're also on television. Uh, it's a huge deal for Fender. So, you know, I said his significance. Well, the Telecaster was seen as a boat anchor or a boat paddler. It was a toilet seat guitar or all these other things. Well, Jimmy Bryant's a virtuoso guitarist and he legitimizes the instrument. So all of a sudden, all those other guitarists, especially in Southern California, all these great players, they start picking up Telecasters also because he made it cool. I mean, he's the guy. You know, they, you know, he's playing on out, you know, on, on records in the early '50s, and there he is. And then let's let's go ahead and pull this out. This is 1953. This is basically an ad for Fender guitars, well, and Bigsby Steels, but. There's Jimmy holding a broadcaster, and he personalized his by he got a clear Lucite pick guard and, uh, and had a piece of paper under it that had his name and had like a Western motif, like a cowboy on a horse. And, uh, and so this was a, basically a Fender ad and, uh, on, on Capitol Records. I'm kind of surprised they, they let it go this way because, I mean, you can even see the Fender logo and you can... Yeah, and you can see part of the broadcaster part on there too. So, uh, yeah, he's not plugged in though. Uh-oh. <laughs> so, so this, I'll just go ahead and talk about this album while I've got it here, while I'm talking. Uh, yeah, so this is Two Guitars Country Style, and it was released in 53, but it's made up of singles that were cut as early as 1951. And how I know that is... Um, this album was given to me by my buddy Bill McCumber, who's a great pedal steel player down in, in South Texas. He gave me this album and he had Speedy West sign it before he passed away. And Speedy West uh, notated under old Joe Clark that that, uh, that single was cut in 1951 originally. So uh, yeah. And this album is state of the art country playing. It is just ridiculously good. Highly recommend that you find this. And this is not an original pressing. This is a pressing from the late 70s, early 80s on French EMI. And it's, uh, it's excellent and uh, quite a bit cheaper and, uh, than, than trying to find, find an original pressing on, uh, on Capitol. All right, let's, uh, let's keep rolling right along. So here we kind of hit, uh, you know, an unfortunate chapter. So the only thing that could stop Jimmy Bryant was Jimmy Bryant. See, Jimmy Bryant, uh, he liked to drink, and he, uh, you know, and he just got difficult very quickly. You know, maybe it was having to do with the uh, the way people idolized him or, or talked about his playing because he was a phenomenal, you know, just a ridiculously great player. But he, uh, on recording sessions, he uh, would not play commercial. Uh, he just wanted to burn all the time, which I love hearing him burn. But, you know, when you're playing on a Tennessee or any Ford album, you probably need to pull it back some. Uh, he also, as uh, kind of in the uh, Fender the Inside Story by Forrest White, uh, paints a really interesting picture of Jimmy Bryant. And uh, I'll just, you know, kind of set the scene. So this is 1953 or 54, and uh, Forrest ha hasn't been plant manager for very long at Fender, but uh, Jimmy Bryant shows up for the first time in his Cadillac, and he's drinking. And he comes to the employee entrance and just walks in, drinking a beer, and starts talking with some of the employees. Well, of course, Forrest had already put in, you know, rules of concerning, you know, visitors had to come through the visitor entrance and they had to sign in and, 
and that you couldn't have alcohol in the factory and things such as that. So of course, Forrest went over to Jimmy Bryant and uh, approached him. And he said the following, look, I'm Jimmy Bryant and I've been playing your expletive Telecaster, but I don't have to play the expletive, expletive thing if I have to be told what I can or can't do when I come down here. So that's, uh, that's kind of where Jimmy Bryant started heading. And this difficulty, this attitude that he had, it continued and it ended up getting him dropped from Capitol Records. And they ended up releasing the singles that they had on him, they released as an album and uh, called Country Cabin Jazz. And because of Jimmy's attitude, he would not uh, appear for artwork. They wanted to create new artwork for the cover and he said no. So they took Billy Strange and they took a picture of him with a Gretsch 6120. And that's what you see on the cover. It's not even Jimmy on the front of the album. But it's a phenomenal album. I highly recommend you find that, especially if you can find the uh, reissue on the Stetson label. It's quite good and not as expensive as trying to track down a, an original pressing from, uh, from Capitol. Yeah, so he releases some various singles. He, uh, he ends up splitting with Fender because of the aforementioned. Uh, another thing that happened while he was still working with Fender was he was very upset that the Stratocaster wasn't called the Jimmy Bryant model. And, uh, and he wouldn't play a Stratocaster because of that. They made him a beautiful black Stratocaster. I think it's a 55. It was at the... Uh, Songbird Guitar Museum down in Chattanooga for a while before that museum closed, and I got to see it. It's just a, a beautiful guitar. And uh, yeah, and he started losing guitars, losing Telecasters, and asking for more and more of them. And finally, Leo cut him off. And of course, Jimmy said, Well, I'm not going to play Fenders anymore. And so then he started playing Rickenbackers and all sorts of different guitars, uh, Vox for a while, uh, Magnatone, you know played all sorts of guitars throughout the 60s. He, uh, he ended up getting a deal with Imperial Records and uh, released a number of albums on there. There's a couple of those that are really good. I'll talk about that in a moment. And then uh, by, he also, he writes the song, Only Daddy That'll Walk the Line. And so, which is a big hit for, uh, you know, for Waylon Jennings, but also gets covered by Everyone from like the Kentucky Headhunters to even Linda Ronstadt records a version called Only Mama That'll Walk the Line. And it begs the question, why didn't he write more songs or was that the only hit he had, you know, in his, uh, in his pocket? But uh, throughout the 70s, he kind of wanders around, uh, not really changing his attitude, really. Um, he goes to Nashville and he gets rejected by the producers there. Uh, he goes back and forth between California and Georgia, and then he develops lung cancer. And he, uh, you know, kind of makes a trip back out to L.A. They do a tribute for him at, uh, at the Palomino, and he gets back to Georgia, and he passes away in 1980 from lung cancer, September of 1980. And I think, uh, really, you have to take off your hat to Albert Lee, and to Guitar Player Magazine for keeping the memory of Jimmy Bryant alive, especially throughout the 80s and 90s. And when his albums were out of print, pretty much, and you couldn't find anything on him. But Albert Lee continued to talk about him in his interviews. And of course, Albert was interviewed quite a bit then. And Guitar Player, uh, you know, did quite a few articles, including one on the Stratosphere double neck, which was the 12 string and six string double neck that he used for Stratosphere Boogie and, and Deep Water, which is so cool, so great sounding. It was tuned in thirds, and it's just, a, a, those are amazing tracks, especially Deep Water. I, I really love that. So, and then, then people like Deke Dickerson and uh, other guys started bringing him up. Bear Family did a wonderful box set on him. Razor and Tie did a couple of compilations, a Sundazed, did a, a Jimmy Bryant compilation. And uh, yeah, so now it's not so hard to find those things. A lot of those things are still are become out of print again, but you can find those things on eBay. And there's some stuff that you can find here on, on YouTube or 
you know, on uh, various you know, streaming platforms, you can find a variety of, of Jimmy Bryant music to listen to. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about his gear. So one interesting point about his gear was his amp. And that's that he liked to use a very early Fender amp in his recording. And despite Leo Fender giving him later amps, he would keep using this old amp. So it was a Woody Pro. Now, if you're not familiar with the Woody Pro, this is pre-tweed. And it just had a wood cabinet with a built-in wooden handle. And usually had a red front with a metal strip or two on the front of it. These amps had octal preamp tubes, which create a very different sound than using the regular preamp tubes we're used to now. A powerful, raw, big sound. And also the amp had a field coil speaker, which means that it had AC voltage going directly to the speaker, which has a transformer on it, and uh, which is uh, very dangerous. And that's why a lot of the amps that have those uh, those types of speakers will have some type of lattice work or grill work on the back to allow ventilation, but it'll not allow you to touch it because you could be electrocuted. Uh, so that was his favorite amp to play through to record with. Even when Fender gave him later pros and twins and things like that, he, he always enjoyed that amp and used that throughout the 50s. So that's that's the amp that you're hearing on most of the the most of his work in the 50s. It's a, uh, it's a Woody Pro with a 15. Guitar-wise, uh, those early recordings were mainly a broadcaster, and that's the, the broadcaster that he had that Leo gave him, the first one he gave him, and, and he put, a, the, again, the clear Lucite scratch plate with the design underneath. He also had a no-caster. Now, here's the interesting about the guitar. Now, broadcasters didn't have the wiring scheme that was on like the 52 telly and, and, and later guitars up to 67. So this was the wiring scheme of a broadcaster. Front position was the neck pickup through that horrible capacitor and resistor that sounded woofy and terrible. Middle position was the neck pickup by itself. Now this is the position, if you look at pictures of Jimmy Bryant, most of the time it's in that position. But then in the back position, it was the bridge pickup, but then this was not a tone control in any of the positions. It was a blend control of the neck pickup. So you could hit the back pickup and then you could blend in as much of the neck pickup as you wanted. So I think that's, that's the sound. That's the guitar. That's the Telecaster that you hear on those Jimmy Bryant, you know, Speedy West recordings. I think it's the broadcaster. And he's either using the neck pickup by itself or he's using the bridge pickup with neck pickup blended in. Uh, strings and picks that he used. Uh, he was famous for going back to the factory when he needed to change strings or needed any type of adjustment on his guitar. He would just show up, and I'm guessing probably with a, a beer in his hand, and they would uh, change his strings. Um, now, I've, I've done some deep, uh, a bit of a deep dive with Nacho, who of course wrote the Blackguard book and the Pinecaster book that was just released. I've also talked to uh, various people at George Grun's uh, you know, offices. And as far as we can tell, and no one's willing to stake their reputation on it, but this is everyone's willing to say that as far as we know, pure nickel round wound strings were on the first Fender guitars, not flat wounds. And they were basically 12 through 52 with a wound third. Now, a lot of people think Jimmy used flat wound strings, but if you've tried nickel plated strings and pure nickel strings, and of course you get to strings that size, you, it ends up being more like a flat wound sound because it's emphasizing the fundamental and doesn't have as much of the brassiness that regular uh, you know, nickel plated strings will have. So, uh, so he was using basically pure nickel strings, 12 through 52 with a wound third, and then he used a little Fender Jazz pick either medium or heavy, not sure on that. And he used, you know, his, his broadcaster and no-caster on those, you know, wonderful recordings. Then, of course, he had the Stratosphere double neck that the 12-string was, was tuned in thirds. And that is the sound on those, uh, those classic uh, recordings from the 50s. By the time you get into later recordings, like the things on Imperial and such, 
he's probably using a later Telecaster. So here, while we're, we'll pick up some of these albums and, and, and show you. So again, there's two guitars, country style. Um, this is on Imperial. This is the uh, fastest guitar, guitar in the country. This is, he's in his Vox era. And uh, who knows if he actually recorded with it. I'm guessing he probably used a Telecaster because that was what he was most comfortable with. Then you even have this one, Bryant's back in town. And uh, you know, here he is with a magnetone on the cover with a cigarette in his mouth that'll eventually kill him. And, uh, but on the back, he's got a maple cap Telecaster. You can tell because it doesn't have a plug on the headstock. And of course I love maple cap tellies. But uh, yeah, there's another picture of him at the bottom with it. And with Audie Murphy, the World War II uh, hero. Well, he's the most decorated, I believe, uh, soldier in the Second World War. Uh, then you have um, Play Country Guitar with Jimmy Bryant. I found this for a couple of bucks someplace. And uh, it's not amazing by any means, but I just bought it because it was, it was neat to have. And he's, he's playing the magnetone guitar there. So... Uh, as far as, uh, again, albums to pick up, I would, I would try to find any of the compilations you can find. I like Razor and Tie or Sundays. Uh, if, you're, if you're a vinyl guy, I would definitely try to get Two Guitars Country Style on the French EMI reissue, and I would try to get the uh, Country Cabin Jazz on, uh, on the Stetson UK album, that reissue. So, uh, yeah, I guess the only other note as far as his gear uh, was... You know, toward the end of his life, he was playing a red Gibson uh, 355 that uh, had the veritone removed, and he uh, enjoyed that guitar a lot. And uh, on the final recordings that he did with uh, Speedy West, which they did a, a recording in the, in the 70s in Nashville called For the Last Time, he wanted to play that guitar, and uh, Speedy West convinced him to play a Telecaster instead for that recording. And that's a, that's a good album, but it's not as strong as their 50s material. So, well, I need to, uh, to kind of give credit where credit is due. Uh, of course, Forrest White's uh, Fender the Inside Story, of course, had the interesting uh, anecdote about uh, Bryant showing up at the uh, factory with his beer. Uh, Rich Keinzel uh, wrote this uh, great little old book called uh, Great Guitarist, had a great section on, uh, on Jimmy that I learned a lot from. Also... Uh, Probably the greatest single book on Fender history is Fender, The Sound Heard Round the World by Richard Smith. This is a wonderful book. This is the first edition of it. I've worn the dust cover off. <laughs> and that has some great uh, stories and pictures of, of Jimmy. Then also, uh, this is uh, Jimmy's sister, Loreen, wrote a book about Jimmy. It's out of print, uh, but you can uh, still find copies around. Unfortunately, people want 50 or 60 bucks for them, but I, uh, I went down and, and, and bought this. And this is nice because you get to see the broadcaster with the, uh, with the black guard still on it before you put the uh, Lucite guard. And this was good also because uh, it's one, it's, it's very kind of a personal recollection of their, of their life. But then uh, the, the last section of the book is uh, they were able to get permission from Guitar Player Magazine to reprint many of the articles that were done throughout the 80s. And so that was very helpful. So wonderful. Thank you for, for that. All right, guys, I hope you will dig into Jimmy Bryant, uh, whether it's on Spotify or YouTube or wherever, and you will uh, dig his tone and his influence and how important he was in the evolution of Fender guitars, in in kind of legitimizing the uh, the boat paddle, and uh, I'll see you next time. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.